thanks so much to SciCon for having me. Uh, I want to thank Spencer Marks for introducing me to the uh, LA Skeptics Group, that's how I got here. Uh, I want to talk to you a bit about SciCom. Uh, I'm a full-time science communicator, so uh, as we just heard, I, I do have a YouTube channel, which is the main focus of what I do. I also wrote a book, I give talks, uh, so this is what I do full-time. And uh, however, the term science communicator is still relatively new. It hasn't quite penetrated the cultural lexicon yet. That is starting to change, but of course, the concept of communicating science is not new. This has been around for decades, so we can look to uh, an early pioneer, Carl Sagan, the great demigod of, of SciComm, and of course, yes, applause for Carl. Uh, his incredible Cosmos series, I think many of you remember, uh, was a landmark in SciComm. Uh, it turned a generation of people on to science. But Carl was an astronomer. He, he was a prominent researcher in his field. Uh, who later uh, pivoted to public outreach, and uh, most of the sci-commers that followed were of the same vein. So your Neil Tysons and uh, Mr. Dawkins, who's with us here this weekend, uh, these were uh, these are researchers, right? They they uh, they worked through a particular field of science, and uh, that is beginning to change. And so uh, society is starting to understand the incredible need for good science communication and that the skill set required to effectively communicate science is very different from the skill set required to do research. Uh, and so we're seeing these graduate programs crop up uh, in SciComm, whereby a student can get a bachelor's degree in some area of science, so chemistry, physics, biology, whatever, and then go directly into a graduate program where they can harness these skills of communicating science. And so this is foregoing the traditional route of specialization, where traditionally you're going to go and get a doctorate in a particular field, uh, and instead embracing the concept of being a generalist and becoming good at working with narrative and uh, communicating science. This is an extremely good thing, because science students are well aware of the traditional career paths before them. Right, so everybody knows you can go and become a research scientist. You can go into academia and become a professor. However, there are many students out there, uh, very much as I was. Uh, I was a chemistry student, and I was very passionate about learning science and understanding science and even explaining science. Uh, however, for those who are a bit more of an artist like myself and maybe interested in, uh, in storytelling and creating content and perhaps did not find passion for working in the lab. I hated working in the lab. I couldn't stand it. I thought it was monotonous and tedious. And uh, those paths were not of interest to me. And I think that there are a lot of science students out there that feel the same way. And I want them to be aware that SciComm is a viable third option. It is just as viable as any other scientific career path. And that they are sorely needed. They are sorely needed today in a way that wasn't quite as urgent in Sagan's time. Right? When Sagan did the Cosmos series, there was no internet. Right? And, I mean, or people weren't using it yet anyway. And so, there was nobody logging online and going, oh, Carl Sagan is a NASA shill, ha. You know, it's just a TV show. People were watching the TV show and it was great. But now we're about 30 years strong into the information revolution and we are seeing how the internet has transformed our relationship with epistemology, right? It has completely changed the way we gather information, the way we put together our worldview, the way we interface with current events, with reality in general. It's all about the internet now. And there's a tremendous upside to this. The, the democratization of information is a very, very good thing. However, there's an enormous downside as well, and that is that special interest groups have now had about 30 years as well to practice becoming increasingly adept at crafting propaganda and disinformation for the purpose of manipulating and deceiving the public for various financial and political purposes. And so, when I say the birth of the science communicator, of course I don't mean the birth of all SciComm, right, that's been around, but I mean the birth of this concept of a, a pool of career science communicators who are unencumbered by the responsibilities of research and instruction and all these other things, but instead sit around all day and think about how to explain science to the public. We sit in between the scientific community and the general public to relay the goings-on of the former to the latter. Now, of course, there are scientists who communicate their science, and that's commendable, and we must continue to encourage scientists to do so because that can, that, that can be very powerful. That can hold a lot of sway for a certain group of people. But many or most scientists have neither the time nor the desire nor, quite honestly, the skill set 
to, uh, to effectively communicate science. And we can't sit around and wait to see which scientists are gonna communicate their science because the stakes are too high. There are too many bad faith actors out there that are trying to manipulate the public. So we need, in my estimation, a nearly one-to-one -one correspondence of science communicators with the charlatans that we are meaning to expose. And so the approach here for the SciCommer is twofold. We want to educate and inform the public. So this means offering basic scientific information outside of any particular context, right? Just science, here's some science, in order to inoculate, one might say, the public against disinformation. The other approach is to very specifically and aggressively target and expose every single one of these bad faith actors. It must be done. They must be neutralized. And so these are the two things that I do on my channel. My channel has always been a database of academic tutorials for science students and possibly inquisitive, inquisitive lay people. But uh, in the past four years or so, I've become increasingly involved in the, de in the debunking space. And so in preparing this talk today, I thought it might be a waste of time to try to convince you all that science denial is a problem. I think that we are all on board. It would be preaching to the choir. So I thought that perhaps I could share with you some of the strategies that I've employed in fighting uh, science denial uh, to just talk about where perhaps we have had some successes so far. <clears throat> so the thing that got me into the debunking was flat earth of all things. Uh, so I had made an astronomy series with just academic astronomy tutorials and I finished it off with a little video about how we know the earth isn't flat. I had heard that people think the earth is flat, didn't look into it at all and made a little video about how we know that it is round based on information from uh, prior in the series. And I did not expect the flat earth community to descend upon it with a vengeance and <laughs> make content mocking me and this guy is a shill, et cetera. And uh, I'm a pretty vindictive fellow and at that point was not, <laughs> you know, I was not used to people talking about me online at that time. All I made was organic chemistry tutorials, so there's there nothing controversial, but uh, now people talk crap about me every day. But uh, at this time I thought this won't do at all, so I made a video mocking them. I took their little live stream, cut it up, and it is now the most viewed video on my channel. But anyway, I, uh, after that, I subsequently became intimately aware with all of their talking points, and I kind of milked it and made a good amount of content uh, just tearing it all down. So uh, <clears throat> with something like Flat Earth, I do find that it is extremely effective to offer simply basic irrefutable scientific concepts. And I do think that this is possibly the only area where this is effective, because there, most other areas of science denial, that does not suffice. However, with something like Flat Earth, which is just so indefensible, bottom of the barrel, falls apart with the, the, the slightest ounce of scrutiny, it can be very effective to put forward uh, simple scientific facts. And so we're not going to do a whole Flat Earth debunk here, but just to give you one example of what I'm talking about, the Flat Earthers, uh, they need to take the point that is the South Pole and kind of unwrap the globe such that the point turns into the whole perimeter of their little pizza land there. And uh, so there are very uh, hilarious ramifications here, just one of many being which, obviously anybody, if we take these three people standing at the southern tips of those three continents, um, if you look directly south in the night sky, you can see the Southern Cross. If you look right at the South Pole, you've got the Southern Cross. So the Flat Earthers would have us believe that these three people are all seeing the same thing despite looking in completely different directions. So that's just one example of hundreds, but uh, uh, again, <clears throat> we're talking about presenting uh, naked eye observations and logic a child could understand. And this is something that has been, I think, very effective in bringing hundreds of people uh, back from the brink of delusion, <laughs> I think. Uh, going one rung up the ladder here, we get to your kind of garden variety, snake oil salesmen, uh, uh, supplement peddlers, and uh, energy healers, and things of this nature. And so here with this, these kind of grifters, they rely very heavily on narrative and buzzwords. And so one thing that I found very effective is to kind of reclaim these buzzwords that are being used inappropriately and simply define them uh, in, in a very specific way. <clears throat> so words like natural and synthetic have come to take on an inherently positive and negative connotation respectively in a way that has nothing to do with what the words mean. Organic has become kind of a nebulous buzzword, more of a marketing term than anything else. Theory, even a word like theory, they will attempt to conflate it with the colloquial connotation of just a guess. And so all of these words, I think that they can be reclaimed by just rigorously defining them with examples 
to help kind of deprogram people in a way of the rhetoric or the way that these words are being misused. Just to give you one concrete example of this, uh, so we all know L ascorbic acid is vitamin C, right? Vitamin C is the vitamin nickname of L ascorbic acid, has various functions in the body. But the, uh, the supplement peddler will tell you about the vitamin C complex, right? This is the thing, nature makes this thing. It's got many components there. And uh, that's the thing that you need for the body to work properly. And uh, a synthetic ascorbic acid is just the shell. It's the shell of this. It evokes a sense of hollowness, right? And so there you go, nature good, man bad. Now, the problem here, obviously, is that vitamin C complex is not a thing. That's, it's a fabrication. It does, not, it does not exist. But to somebody who has no knowledge of biochemistry, this could be a very alluring narrative. So how do you get somebody, how do you convince someone that this doesn't exist without, we don't have the luxury of, uh, give me 10 hours to teach you basic biochemistry. It's not going to happen. So for such people, I find that Google can actually be a very useful tool if you know how to use it. And so I will say to such a person, if the vitamin C complex is a thing, and you Google that term, what are you going to get? And you can ask them, make a prediction, tell me, what are you going to get when, when we Google this together? And they'll tell you, okay, all right, where there's going to be some journal articles, people are studying the thing, right? Uh, at the very least, a Wikipedia entry, it's going to tell you what it is in a neutral way, right? But no, it's page after page after page of people trying to sell you stuff. So this can be an eye-opening experience for somebody who puts stock in this narrative, in this, in this alluring narrative of naturalism, nature over man, right? Because they were convinced by a narrative about big pharma and their profit motives. Well, here we can see the profit motives, very clear, right in front of your face. It's nothing but people trying to sell you stuff. And of course, uh, the alt-health industry operates this way. The alt-health industry operates with this anti-establishment uh, narrative for the purpose of fear-mongering. So this is an image they will try to implant in people's minds. This is obviously supposed to be a GMO. So we have a fruit, and we have the colored liquids in the syringes for whatever reason. And then they've got the stitches there, which are meant to evoke Frankenstein's monster and the, the hubris of man in uh, fiddling with nature, of course. And so this is what the alt-health industry will do. They will implant these images to capitalize on the backlash. And we are seeing that backlash in no greater way than in the current wave of anti-vaccine hysteria in the post-COVID era. It has truly ballooned out of control. Uh, it is capturing even somewhat rational minds and turning them in this direction. And so that, this is a very short talk. We, can't, we could talk about vaccines for 10 hours, um, but I will just give you one example of a tactic that I like to use. <clears throat> so. People who turn to anti-vax in these sort of uh, anti-establishment narratives are swayed by narrative, as we said. Narrative is very key here. And so, of course, we can go and deconstruct the narratives, the false narratives that they have fallen for. And we do that. We must do that. But another thing that we can do is use narrative to our advantage. Right? They fell for a narrative, so let's give them a narrative. And so much of the modern anti-vaccine or the, the vaccine hesitancy that we are seeing, at the very least, is linked back to Andrew Wakefield. So I think many of you maybe remember Andrew Wakefield as the guy who penned the uh, fraudulent uh, Lancet study linking the MMR vaccine to autism. And uh, a lot of it always keeps going back to this guy. Even RFK Jr. is still doing the vaccines and autism thing, and it's because of this guy. And so there is a story here. <clears throat> Andrew Wakefield, there's a story of Andrew Wakefield. There's a story of the injury lawyers that approached him and bribed him to fabricate the study, and then the, how the Lancet retracted it, and then how he had a, stand, uh, a, a patent for a standalone measles vaccine, which he stood to profit from if the MMR was no longer used. Right, this is a story. So these are just some screenshots from a debunk I did. And so when you can present it this way, you, can, you, you stand a chance at, encaps, uh, at capturing the mind of, that, of the person who is receptive to narrative-driven uh, points. Because at the very least now, at the very least, they now have competing narratives that they can examine. So here's the narrative of, the, of, of Big Pharma and, and the profit-driven uh, profit motives there. Once again, we have Andrew Wakefield, and the profit-driven motives are right here staring you in the face. So this can maybe sow the seeds of doubt in, in some minds that will say, okay, well, I didn't really think of it that way, <laughs> right? Um, okay, I'm going to pivot now <clears throat> to something that I have been focusing on very heavily lately. So the Discovery Institute is a Christian propaganda mill out of Seattle, very well funded by wealthy uh, Christian nationalists, and it essentially operates as creationism in a tuxedo, is the way I like to describe it. 
And so their intentions are made abundantly clear by this internally leaked uh, wedge document, which uh, if you look at the bottom left, the 20-year goals, it's a little hard to read, but the bottom one says, to see design theory permeate our religious, cultural, moral, and political life. And political life. So the translation here is uh, the erosion of the separation of church and state and the installation of uh, theocracy, much like Iran, but for Jesus. Uh, so their first attempt here the, the, to get the ball rolling, they wanted to get religion taught in public school science classes. And so that's intelligent design, which is just creationism rebranded. Uh, and that was the Kitzmiller v. Dover trial of 2005. And very fortunately, they were not successful. It went very poorly for them. And it was ruled that ID is not science and should not be taught in public school science classes as well it shouldn't because it isn't science. Uh, since that failure, they focused largely on their blog, Evolution News, where they try to discredit real science, <clears throat> as well as a mountain of propaganda on YouTube where they lie about evolutionary biology, paleontology, uh, anthropology, and uh, various other fields. And so this is something I have been focusing on quite a lot lately. And there are some tactics here to elucidate. And so the shtick with the DI is they present themselves as very scholarly, right? So here's this uh, well-groomed man in a suit. He's got a PhD in a tangentially related field who is showing you the science, right? It's not, it's not the crazy preacher. It's weird scientists and here's the science, right? Let me show you the primary scientific literature. This is what it says. Uh, so this is, a, this is a screenshot from one of their videos. As you can see, obviously we're very zoomed in, right? We're not looking at the whole article. And this is about Lucy, the famous Australopithecine specimen. And uh, the claim being made by the narrator of the video is that this paper, this article, not them, but this article claims that Lucy was a knuckle walker. Now, of course, any anthropologist will tell you, no, Lucy was bipedal. This is unanimously agreed upon. And this can, be, this can be exposed very easily by comparing their claims to the primary scientific literature. So much of my content involves simply taking what they say about the literature and then showing you the literature because they know that their viewers will not look at it themselves. And if you just go point by point and offer a little bit of background information, it's very easy to show how they are quote mining, how they are deliberately misrepresenting the literature, and so this can be very effective for people who, who fancy themselves as scholarly because they're saying, okay, it's not about religion. Look, this is about the science. These guys are looking at the primary literature. They're showing me the papers, telling me what the papers say. Well, no, this is what the papers say. Now, of course, that's not gonna work for everybody because some are gonna say, all right, well, I don't understand what they're saying. I don't understand what you're saying. So I'm just gonna go with them because that's my club. So for these people, I find we need to go a little bit further, and it's actually not that difficult, as I've found, to contact the primary authors of these papers and get statements from them. So this is the author, this is the primary author of that Lucy paper, and I contacted him, and his correspondence begins thusly. Wow, yes, Luskin's comment is a flagrant mischaracterization of our scientific results. And he elaborates. <clears throat> So if you are one of these people who put stock in the DI as a credible voice in the scientific sphere, uh, and you have the courage to watch my video, it's gonna be pretty hard to get around this, right? This isn't dumb old Dave without a PhD talking. This is, pri this is the primary author of that paper explicitly stating that they are lying about his research. So this will leave an impact on anybody who is able to find the courage to watch this content. And so I've just been tearing through this whole, the whole roster of these guys and I just go uh, person by person, make a video here, just show how everything they're saying is a completely fraudulent, a complete misrepresentation of the scientific literature. And uh, the good thing about this is that these, because of, there's a little bit of drama, they do very well, they're very popular videos, such that they tend to be the number one search result for the, that person's name on YouTube and in some cases even Google. So, thank you, I'm very proud of it. So you, you search this guy, maybe you're on the fence, you don't know what's going on. The first thing that pops up is me explaining to you for an hour how the guy's a fraud. So, now, uh, they're not too pleased with it. Now, lest you think that I'm bullying these guys, I wanna reiterate and look at some other things to show you exactly how urgent this is. Not that I think you need convincing, but let's do it anyway. Um, this is a tweet uh, advertising a recent propaganda leaflet and it says, scientism is leading the dangerous expansion of government, the dramatic rise of censorship and mass dehumanization. 
all in the name of science. And the leaflet is called, are we entering an era of totalitarian science? Totalitarian science. So if you can imagine, obviously this is capitalizing on the sentiment, public sentiment in the post-COVID era, people who didn't like the vaccine mandates and the masks and the things of this nature, and they're spinning this web of lies about an unprecedented government overreach uh, in response to this situation. Now this is insane. Uh, there have been compulsory vaccines. In the past there have been countries that forced their citizens to get vaccinated, which is why we don't have smallpox anymore. Now, if you wanna make the case that governments shouldn't do that and it's okay to have smallpox around, you can make that argument, I guess. But the idea that there is some unprecedented government overreach is objectively false. In the past, people have been forced to get vaccines and the American public was not forced to get COVID vaccines. That didn't happen. So, um, this is clearly a fabrication meant to instill the idea of some Orwellian force above us. And the same with the censorship and everything like that. It's just educated people pushing back against lies and propaganda. And this is encapsulated even better, I think, by this tweet. It says, why we can't trust the science journals. Just the science, the science journals, all of them. So basically, it's why we can't trust science. The, the intention here is so blatantly transparent, it's not even funny. They're not even trying to do this like, oh, we're scientists too thing. We publish in journals as well. No, they're saying don't trust any science. They're saying if it's in a journal, it's corrupt, it's a lie. If a scientist says it, it's a lie, it's wrong. Right? The idea here is to manipulate the public into completely uh, uh, denying any concept of scientific authority and, and saying, no, you listen to us, we'll tell you what's true. This is an assault on science, this is an assault on reality. It's very clear, and the intention is very clear, as I said. The intention is to establish a Christian theocracy in this country, and it's, it's you know, we're seeing this with the rollback of women's rights. We're seeing this with the recent news of the Speaker of the House. This is happening slowly but surely, it is, and we've seen theocracies established in the not too distant past Again, Iran being a, a premier example, and it's terrible what goes on there to citizens who dare speak any kind of dissent against the government. Now, are we around the corner here? I don't think we're quite around the corner, but to think it couldn't happen is naive, right? It absolutely could happen, and there are very wealthy people who are actively trying to make this happen. So the question is, why would citizens willingly give up their rights for the establishment of, the, of a theocracy? Well, they wouldn't. Not even religious people would give up those rights willingly, but that's where the propaganda comes in. That's where they need to come at this at the angle of there is this looming totalitarian Orwellian power and we need to take the power away from them. In order to do that, you need to give the power to us. We'll keep you safe. It's a tale as old as time. So that's why there's no area of science denial that can be ignored. Nothing, not even flat earth, not even things that we think are stupid. There's no area of science denial that we can, that we can ignore because the public is not able to compartmentalize science the way other people, the way scientists are able to. They don't see it as, okay, we've got biochemistry here, cosmology over here. They don't look at it that way. They look at it as one room with about a dozen dudes in lab coats doing all the science. They, they see it this way. And this misconception is what allows propagandists to uh, polarize them against science by doing simple things like weaponizing the word consensus, right? That's what they've done because they, they know that they have zero ability to fabricate a pile of fake science that is gonna compete with the real science. So instead what they choose to do is implant a negative connotation in a word like consensus such that the public will recoil from its very sight. They will see the word consensus and go, oh, corruption. Consensus equals corruption. And that is what they've done to some degree of success. What is consensus supposed to mean? It's supposed to mean that the overwhelming majority of people who have any clue what they're talking about a particular topic agree that such thing is true. right? And there's no getting around this. So the only way is to sell a narrative with corruption as, uh, as its basis. <clears throat> Unfortunately, popular media has exacerbated things with clickbait titles like all of physics is wrong and all of science is wrong and things like that. And they're clickbait titles for a reason, they get the clicks, and they get the clicks because there's a very receptive audience of people out there 
who are prone to science denial because they didn't like science. And they think, well, I, I hated science, and I didn't learn any science, and that's a good thing, because look at that. It was all wrong anyway. Would have been a waste of time. So that is, again, why there is no area of science denial that we can ignore. It, it, when, when we see a headline that says, the James Webb Space Telescope proves the Big Bang didn't happen. You guys remember that? About a year ago that was going around. It doesn't matter that cosmology and astrophysics doesn't really have much of an influence on public life. It doesn't really influence us day to day. That doesn't matter because the average person is going to see that and they're going to go, see, the scientists were lying about the Big Bang and they're lying about the vaccines and they're lying about the climate. It's all one thing to them. So in the end, this is the singular thread that I feel uh, unites all uh, science denial uh, and propaganda that is anti-science is this concept of an anti-establishment bias, an anti-establishment narrative. There must be the scientific community painted as this looming, overwhelming, totalitarian, Orwellian entity. And that is how they can sell you the idea of the brave rebel, of your Luke Skywalker, of your whistleblower, of your truth teller, or what have you. This is the only way that they can get people to put more stock in a singular unqualified charlatan over literally the entire body of scientific knowledge. This is the narrative that must be used. It's the only way. So uh, I see this as truly the existential challenge of the 21st century. How do we get people to know what is true, politically, scientifically, et cetera? And uh, I think that it could be the difference between a utopia and a dystopia, is whether or not we figure out how to do this. Because you can go and tell me, well, Dave, no, climate is a bigger thing. This is an asteroid, whatever. How are you going to get people to mobilize against a specific science-based threat if we cannot get them to agree that the threat exists? There's no way to do it. There's no way to put pressure on governing bodies to act accordingly. The public needs to be united in these endeavors. So. Uh, we're at a war. It's a war. I see it as a war. I see myself as a warrior in a war uh, against those forces who seek to manipulate the public for political and financial purposes and polarize them against science. And how do you fight a war? You need an army. And uh, you need an army because there's not one way to do this. There's not one way to explain science because there's not one way that people learn or accept information. We need people doing this in every tone, in every style, in every format, in, uh, to every demographic, in every language, on every platform. Th there's too many social media platforms and there can't be anywhere that these charlatans are able to hide. We need a nearly one-to-one -one correspondence of science communicators devoted to the task of neutralizing these bad faith actors, or human society might not see the 22nd century. So that's why I'm very passionate about visiting colleges and institutions and speaking to young science students, uh, I'm there to enlist, right? SciComm wants you. I want them to know about this third career path. You don't like research? You don't want to be a professor? Do SciComm. We need you badly. And so uh, if anyone is affiliated with, the, uh, with any institution would like for me to come speak to their science students, I take this very seriously. Please get in touch with me. And uh, let's see if we can win this war. Thanks so much for hearing me. <laughs>